Larry always begins the first testimony of the evening. So, Larry, would you come on up? Because Larry comes at 6 a.m. Anybody that gets up at 6 a.m. can be the first to justify. That's my belief. And uh, we're going to hear those things, and then we're going to touch Hebrews because we're to see Jesus. But please, Larry. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, the glory of your presence, sweet Jesus. You fire my heart with songs of praise and deliverance. You are my heartbeat, my rock upon which I stand. You are my all in all. And then I went to the old song, Blessed be the rock of my salvation. That Psalm 118, Psalm 18, and it says, uh, the Lord liveth, blessed be the rock, let the God of my salvation be exalted. And we went through this entire psalm, it's a very, very long psalm. I went to Psalm 63, and my favorite portion is where it says, your presence, the, uh, of your presence, the greatest thing I desire is your presence, that isn't what it says. Um, oh, the glory of your presence. And it says the anointing of your presence is the greatest thing I desire. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the Passion Translation. But we were carrying the burden of the Supreme Court thing today. And so finally we got into that. We begin to pray over that which has devastated America for several years. 60 million deaths of babies. So we repented. We repented. The, there were four or five of us at that time. We repented over abortion. And we asked God to heal the heart of every woman that's considered it or done it. Every man that was involved and would not take responsibility. And then it dawned on us, it doesn't matter what the court decides. It is the heart of men and women across America that needs to be changed. So we began to cry out to the Lord of hosts, to the Lord of compassion, the Lord of forgiveness, mm -hmm. the Lord of grace, and mercy, to have mercy on the people of America, to change their heart. Because mm. when their hearts change, Planned Parenthood will disappear. The laws will be beside the point. They can law, they just say anything they want, but if no one is gonna have an abortion, they're gonna have abortion. The heart has changed. People are going to want their children. We prayed for the children, and we realized every aborted child is in heaven under the care of the Lord Jesus. So it's not for the children. We pray for the people that had the children, that gave those children up. And my wife, my wife lost a baby. She didn't abort a baby. She lost a baby. And I've heard her talk about that. When she lost this child, she still can feel that child. And it's been years and years and years. That child was never, just a little, little tin embryo. But I hear that testimony from Melanie. And who knows what the testimony is for those that actually aborted their children. But today is the day of forgiveness, the day of reconciliation, the day of deliverance, yes. and the day of salvation, yes. and total yes. healing yes. for every woman Every man has been involved in destroying children in America. And Father, we thank you yes, Lord. that you're releasing Lord, forgiveness. Heal. You're releasing Mercy. freedom. Yes. You're releasing uh, total reconciliation. Because Jesus, you mm. are the reconciler. By your death, we've been reconciled to God. And by your life, we are saved, as it says in Romans 5. So, Father, we thank you that today, this special day of reconciliation for what has happened to our nation, we declare this today forgiveness, mm -hmm. salvation, deliverance, 
and healing has come to America today. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Wes, would you come on up? Because you were here during the second uh, four-hour session. I'd love to hear what God was seeing. You were seeing and praying. Hello, Jubilee. The fire, the fire kept burning, and uh, we went way beyond the 10 to 2 and was with Becky all the way up until the 6 p.m. And the one thing that really came alive, it, there was so much in the 10 to 2, but there was something that came alive in the, in the 2 to 6 time, and it was through uh, Song of Solomon. It's the bridegroom praising the bride, his beloved, and from that praise, it shifts gears into chapter 5 to the dark night of the soul. And I believe that right now, if the beloved can recognize the praise of her bridegroom, she's going to be brought through the dark night of the soul in such a way where she's going to come out his and not be taken captive by all that is going to come against her from the bridegroom's pursuit of her. Because... His pursuit of her is going to keep her even when he reveals himself and she's trying to keep herself from the world or abstain from the things that she once used to get herself into. And now she turns him down and she freaks out that he's gone and she runs out and she tries to find him and religion beats her up and all these things come against her. So I just want to read um, mm -hmm. out of Song of Solomon. This is 4 9. It says, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love and the scent of perfumes than all spices. Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon, a garden enclosed, is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Then it shifts gears into uh, chapter 5 and 5-2. It goes, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It's the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchman who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I'm lovesick. So I just want to pray and agree that the Lord's blessing and pursuit and intimacy that he is all in and his covenant that's all together for his beloved is enough to keep beloved bride of Christ through all the storms, through all the adversity, through the times where everything seemingly disappears from the connection, the time where she's experiencing him, she's experiencing his voice, experiencing the breath of his counsel, the life of his spirit, and then all of a sudden, it's as if he's disappeared, it's as if he's gone, and everything else is coming her way. So let's just agree right now that there's going to be an experiential, experiential transaction mm. from the beloved being mm. pursued, Jesus. 
to everything leaving and the beloved having nothing to rely upon, nothing to depend upon, and for her to come back into first love, into that encounter. So yes, let's agree, let's stand up, and we're just going to declare this. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. Mm. We give you glory for first love. Yes. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him in love. Called without anything to offer him to be before him in love. Called not because of what we've done, but because of what he decided before mm. time began. Before the king, without anything to offer him, but naked, wretched ways. And he says, I am yours and you are mine and everything that I have is yours and you are altogether lovely and I bless you and I adorn you and I give you everything that I am and you are mine and nothing can take you from me. And I thank you that that pursuit that comes from what was predestined before the world ever was is enough to show us that sanctification, that setting ourselves apart for this lover is nothing but a love affair, nothing but a response of our heart, nothing but worship. But when we get into that place of recognizing that the world, the devil, and the flesh have nothing to offer us, we get really good at keeping things out of our garden, of trying to keep ourselves away from what's coming near us, and we get good at protecting ourselves. We get good at isolating. We get good at trying not to get into situations of temptation. And as that bride, as the beloved is laying down and recognizing that she is the bridegroom, all of a sudden the bridegroom comes and she's now set apart but she doesn't know that he's coming to a deeper place he's coming to touch things that she didn't want touched he's coming to do things that have never been done so she almost turns him down she doesn't know that her moment of visitation has come where she gets a deeper invitation into his heart to have him walk through the garden of her heart have him experience the fragrance of the the worship of a heart that's fully his and he comes and he reaches through the latch because she didn't respond to the door and now she's hearing what's happening but she's making excuses because she wants to be his but she doesn't know that what she is clean in is temporary but he is the only one that can keep her to be purified to be a purified bride to be kept to be preserved, oh. to be his forever. And he reaches through with the myrrh, the representation of death. And he reaches through and he goes in to the latch of the door. And now the myrrh is dripping and she recognizes her day of visitation, the moment of her encounter. She has missed it and she longs to get with him. She longs to be with him. She longs to make up for that momentary glitch and she runs out to go be with him and she's approached by religion and she's walled in and she's beat up and she's spoken down to and belittled and she's chopped down and she recognizes that something's wrong but I declare now in the name of Jesus that the beloved that has experienced her bridegroom's pursuit the love that the bridegroom has for his beloved is enough to keep her through religion, through the world, through the flesh, through the devil's pursuit of her, through every crooked scheme and every wicked thing, and that she would be a flame again for the burning heart of her passionate bridegroom, and she would not give in to the dark night of the soul to say, I'm done, I'm throwing in the towel, that she would surrender again, that she would return to her beloved bridegroom again, that she would come
come alive to the sound of him calling her, him pursuing her, him visiting her time and time again, him making himself known, hiding himself, and then making himself known. Let her recognize that the moment of her visitation doesn't end when she can't feel him. The moment of her visitation begins the moment that she gets real with him. And I thank you, Father, that there's a bride getting real with her bridegroom. There's the recognition of his closeness, even though he feels afar. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for great awakening in hearts right now that have recognized the hour of their visitation, but were unable to go and respond. And they laid back and they kept themselves in false comfort and they thought of themselves as sanctified and set apart because they became good protectors of themselves but they were being visited for buttons to be pushed for things to come about to bring them into deeper waters and wells deeper living waters and living intimate encounters we thank you father yeah. that yeah. you're bringing this through a yeah. bride that has the been adorned by our beloved groom, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, yes, amen, 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 amen. Uh, anyone else? Becky, do you have something for this? Your, your watch from the two to six hours? I tell you, if you haven't found a way, keep asking God to make a way for you to come and be with us for just about an hour or two or three during the Wednesdays, and if you cannot because of work and because of distance, then just separate yourself and be in the Spirit, and you'll be with us in the Spirit because the depth of things that are breaking open in the corporate setting are just... I've never been in a place like this right now. Go ahead, Becky, please. Well, that's, uh, there's a lot that happened. We prayed for the different generations. They blessed us. We blessed them. But I really feel impressed to just have you raise up your hands right now. You can stay sitting. It's okay. The presence of God is so in the house right now. Yes, he is. I, I couldn't even listen to what people were saying, even though it was wonderful and beautiful. I just kept, every time I raised my hands, I could feel the weightiness of God. The beautiful, the fear of the Lord, the awe of God. I could right. feel his weight in the house. And I really believe that what was prayed today, he has heard our cry. Oh, yes. And he's answering in a supernatural way to every person he is giving mm. gifts today. Mm -hmm. To every mm -hmm. single one. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily what you asked for, mm -hmm. but it's greater than what you've asked for. Mm. Yes, and it's yes. so eternal and everlasting. I thank you, my Father. I thank you, gracious one. I thank you for being here, for filling us. Truly, Father, there is an open heaven over each one of us right now. And you are pouring in the river of living water upon our heads. And Lord God, we're drinking freely. We will never thirst again, and we will never be the same in Jesus' name. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Let's look at uh, Hebrews 5 and 6 for just a few moments. Um, I, I don't know how far I can get into this, and I don't even know when we'll get. We're just doing two chapters. I may only get, I want to get to at least a portion of what often stumbles people. And we're doing this in meditation, so I encourage you just to be living in this. And, and uh, we read scripture slowly, and we chew it, and we allow it, even the hard portions, to become the what matures us as we ponder and we behold and return to and so let's begin father help us in this beautiful this is transitional trans um, changing chapter where instructions are being given and requirements are being set upon your bride and your people give us grace for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sin. This is the relational place the high priest held, was to have a nation in fellowship through sacrifices and the gifts that he was offering on behalf of the people for, for God and for them. And he was, 
and he, had, he could have compassion. Jesus, you know, the old Aaronic priesthood. He had compassion on those who were ignorant and going astray, since he himself was subject to weakness, and that was a, a good intent. If you were not, he understood, I'm, I, I'm, we're all weak. We all have places we're subject to that we don't have victory in, and we don't know what to do. So we could be compassionate. That's what God always wants from us, is to show mercy. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. So he wasn't off the hook just because he had an office of a high priest. He had to, to deal with his own issues and bring his own sacrifices for sins for himself first before he could then hold his place before God for the people. And no man takes this honor to himself, but who is called by God just as Aaron was. So in those first four verses is a history lesson, a mini history lesson on the whole temple tabernacle worship given to Moses. And now it shifts and says, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. He never spoke of it while he walked the planet. He never declared it was his, uh, 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 you know, his goal in life. But it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I've begotten, you know, to see the picture. Of the, he's on the cross. He has become sin. The wrath of God has been placed upon him. It's dark for three hours. You can't see your hand in front of your head, face. God is himself placing the judgment, the, the, the judgment for the sin, the wrath for the rebellion, the curse. Uh, the condemnation, and he's exhausting it on his son. He is God the judge, now judging his son, who has become the offering for sin. And when this is satisfied, when this is made, when he is not only just, but the justifier of those who have faith in him, so he could take care of sin all time, beginning, middle to the end, all at one moment, one offering. He then says to his son, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. I have become your father. This is he who says, you are my son. Can you get that back up? You are my son. Today I've begotten you. That's what causes Jesus to come back, to come alive. He is born again on the cross. You say, well, I thought he had to die to become born again. He did die. Just like Adam died. You remember the story? If you eat this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. The day you eat it, you die. Well, he did. It took him 900 years to die. So apparently death is not the death of the physical man. It's the death of the spirit man. And this is what took place in Jesus. He died. And he was called out of the abyss by being called forth the Son. A new creation. A firstborn of many uh, of, of the life-giving spirit. A brand new man born again. And then he dies on the cross. He also says, in another place, this is now Psalm um, 110, David prophesying, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This occurs at the Pentecost, at the, at the coronation of Jesus, when he sits down and he's exalted and seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's being given glory and honor, and he's crowned, and like the priest, his anointing's poured on, and he receives the Holy Spirit, the promise, and he pours it out. And this priesthood now is the functioning relationship we all get to have with God through Jesus who holds this place, Savior, Lord, High Priest, King of Righteousness, King of, 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 of Peace, and on and on and on. And this functional relationship, which we'll see in chapter 7 and 8, is huge. But he, so here he is. This is after his resurrection, after his ascension. But who, verse 7, gotta, when you scripture, you've got to always let it, tell you where you are in timeline because it's like a good movie a movie tells you takes you right to the moment and it takes you back into a moment prior that led you to this moment then it takes you forward and then it takes you back to another moment that led this moment and it's a circle and it's a place of, of in, engagement so he says who in the days of his flesh so now we're talking about his earth walk and particularly the night of his uh gethsemane when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his godly fear. This man whose soul was now to the point of death, who understood he was about to willingly let the Father 
bruise him and crush him and make his soul an offering for sin. He's crying out, is there any other way? I do not want to do this. Me, Jesus, the man, I cannot, I do not, I won't, but I will if it's the only way, nevertheless, that your will be done. So he was heard, but he wasn't delivered from death, even though he was crying out to the one who could save him from death because he came to die. We see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That was his intentional destination while he walked the earth. And now he's there. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So this is this oxymoron which is so such a key to our life if we can grasp it. Is that even though his sonship from the Virgin Mary's conception to the baptism of John at the Jordan, and this is my son whom I'm well pleased, to the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, hear him. He is just learning to hear under. That's what the word obedience. When you think of obedience, don't think of be, being told to do something, being, being given something to hold as truth in the midst of a lie, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of hostility. You hold these truth, this word that was being spoken, and how you learn to hear under is off of the things that are contrary to what you're hearing, which is so huge in Hebrews, is to understand that with promise comes temptation or testing, and with te testing brings us to a place where we can come into maturity, and there's, a, there's this focus of perfection that God's bringing the body of Jesus into, to a, a place where we, we are, we're here. So Jesus is at that apex of the Gethsemane, and he's saying, I am submitting myself to my Father, even now he's about to be the judge, and he's going to kill me, but it is for the, for the purpose of which was prophesied, the scripture might be fulfilled, and here I am. And so he's just letting go of the stuff that any of us would never be able to let go of, so that he could let God have access through him and to him, and he's learning to hear. Now, why does that matter? Because having been perfected, the word perfected is so huge, it means complete. It is where the body is rushing toward, and it's soon going to become overwhelming for some, and many are going to be swept in without even being able to resist it anymore, because God's coming for a matured bride, a completed bride, bride who is completely dependent upon living in the grace, living in, in union, communion, and delight of, of, of who, they, who the grace that is being given to her in Christ and if relationship. So having been perfected, now we're talking death, resurrection, or, you know, caught, made alive together, raised together, seated up in heavenly places. He's been perfected. He became, which is the word became the author. He became the cause of. That's what the author here. It's not, it, 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 he became the cause of eternal salvation. I haven't, I've barely seen it. Eternal salvation to all who obey him. Word, same word. Obedience, obey. What does obey mean? Here, under. I am here. Life is around me, com combating against me. But though I be here in this life, I am heeding and listening and living under the words of my Lord Jesus. As Jesus learned obedience, though he was a son by the Father, I am learning obedience, so I am a son through listening to Jesus and allowing his words to say who I am and worship him with his word, which all Hebrews calls is our confession of hope. So, wonderful possibilities. Called by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. This priesthood, we'll see, there's so much that, we, that is available to uh, participate in the salvation to the uttermost. Things that have not even been seen ever on the earth that are coming because of salvation is going to be uh, um, 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 uh, brought forth through the intercession of Jesus and the worship. And like Wes talked about, that whole bridal paradigm. Of whom? Now, here's where we go into a focal point, a, 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 connect, a, a disconnect. Of whom? Of whom Jesus, Melchizedek, high priest. We have much to say. Not 
not of, of the topic. The topic being he became high priest because God gave, called him to be high priest forever. And of this high priest, Jesus, we have so much to say, but hard to explain. We've all been there with people, they can be un, especially if they're an unbeliever or just a baby believer, and we're trying to explain something that's become so part of our life. And we're going, I want, and they're just, ah, you know, kind of like a, like a dog looking at a new bowl and going, do I drink out of that or not? Since you have become dull of hearing. Now, the word dull, we have, to, we have to embrace it because if you don't embrace it, you don't get to come get free of it. Dull means to be stupid, lazy. I don't care. Not taking the effort. Uh, we were in, in prayer today, and we came back to the, what is, the, what is the, the, we're to, the commandment of God, the first commandment, to love God with our whole heart, with all our soul with all our mind and all our strength. And I, and I got caught on the mind. And the mind means, it means my deep thought. That's why we're to set our mind on the things above. It's that place of which I am, I am, I am intentionally presenting my, present, position, placing myself inside of God's word without the ability to grasp what he's saying. I'm going to dwell in this place of living water, living word, the logos of God. As chapter 4, we brought us to. And I apologize we didn't get to this for a couple weeks because of my own schedule. But here we are. We have so much to say. That's hard to say because you become dull of hearing. How do you get dull of hearing? For though by this time you ought to be teachers. By this time, at this appointed time in the chronos, not a kairos, a chronos, just in the length of time of, of, of journeying with him, you ought to be a teacher, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, the beginnings of the logos, the foundations of truth. This is what is rapidly going to change, and I, I'm, I'm the first one to run to the altar. I know so little. I know so little and I know there's so much ready to be given but if we re keep on repeating to the beginning point and we need someone we need milk and not solid food milk is easily digestible and it's absolutely incredible if you go well oh, I don't need milk anymore go to first Peter chapter 2 and see what the milk's all about I guarantee you read through that chapter you'll go I haven't thought about half of that Holy nation, royal priesthood, peculiar people, living stones, cornerstone, offering up sacrifices to God and the Spirit. That's who we are. That's milk. <laughs> oh, we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Oh, we're going to be a habitation for God and the Spirit. Oh, there's so much going to happen. It comes because the body of Jesus returns to the head. And he begins to fill us all in all. But you ought to be telling everybody, but you got to go back to need a meal. For everyone, now, now just listen to this. This is, and I, that's why I say meditate this, read this, and read this, and place your, as much of your best time to be in the Bible. Not in the head, but in the heart, to, to see and to listen. He says, for everyone who partakes, who eats, and only of milk is unskilled, has not mastered the, the capacity to, to find and see and learn and to turn and to, to discover and to use a concordance and to meditate in the scripture and to feel the spirit pull. That's why I want to, I beg everyone, if you don't, if you have the time and you're wanting to reactivate the living waters, get inside our prayer meeting because it's the two or more gathered together that places Jesus in the midst because it's not a proc, it's not a, it's not man centric, and we're not trying to equip men. We're trying to please God by listening, softening our heart, so we can respond. All of a sudden, God, Jesus, in the midst of us, starts talking to one of us. Someone prays a prayer, or someone reads a scripture, and triggers another revelation, and you can go exponentially, exponentially into truth that you that would be that would be difficult to come by yourself individual prayer must every day then these corporate prayer is this exponential shift and it goes from six to six and it is my favorite part of the entire week so they are unskilled now here's the word of righteousness 
made righteous in Jesus Christ. No righteousness of my own, not from the law, only what Jesus has accomplished, what the Father did to Jesus, and is his resurrection justification. This is where I stand. His blood gives me the confidence, the boldness, his flesh, and the access. He's my high priest over the house of God. I come. That's, you don't know, you, that's the first, that's the beginning, to learn that word of righteousness. For he's a babe. Now, the word babe, there's three Greek words for uh, uh, child, son. One is technon, means you were born into the family. One is uh, we, we house, which means you are matured. And then there's this one, which is like, uh, oh, I forgot the, forgot it. I could, it's, um, you know, I know, but uh, now, that, uh, now that you guys are going to guesstimate, let me give you the, the word itself, because it's a Greek word. So I have to go to my concordance, which thank God he gave us phones so we could do that. But about that, uh, so he, it says, for, I got to go to King James, for everyone who uses the milk, unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The word babe is nepos. Just kind of sounds baby. What it literally means is a non-speaking infant. If Jesus the word, having conversation, declaring who he is in the word, he expects maturity when we can have conversation with him in the word. If we cannot converse with him in his word, if we cannot hear him in his word and speak back to the things he's saying, we're a baby. And a baby has no confession, has no conversation that they've heard and discovered and grown and have, have settled through the, the revelation that came and the testing that followed. The revelation that comes and the testing that follows. And the revelation that returns and the testing that comes again. And until finally you go, this truth is true. Whether I can prove it or not, whether I ever experience the fullness of what I saw, I will live what I see and not live what's happening to me. That's maturing. Because solid food belongs to those who are full age. That's the word perfection, mature, complete. And it is the word of who are, um, verse, verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Full age is perfection, mature, matured. Those who have by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, Kathy mentioned or Mac mentioned about the Greek influence. So there is, there is influence of the thought of descriptive words that were being written, and especially the Greek. The word uh, have their uh, exercised, senses exercised, reason of use. It's the picture of practicing in the word naked. Means that whole, I carry nothing of me to defend me. I am not trying to justify me. I am naked before him whom I must give an account, like Hebrews 4 said. So therefore, I am going to be vulnerable. And I'm not going to come with a predetermined plan and an outcome. And I'm not going to tell God what to do. I'm not even going to try to influence him on any particular thing except to submit myself to him and learn and discern. And learn to discern. And learn to discern. And inside of every scripture is the possibility that man can take it and make it bring evil. And God can use it and bring forth good. And there's good. There's, evil, there's, there's just so much maturity. And you'll, that's why the ancient wells. That's why the Annas and Simeons. And that's why God's going to spring you up. And you're going to start gushing forth. And that's why the young men and women are going to start coming and go, I want to touch that. I see. I see. You're my grandpa, Abraham. And I want you to tell me again, what was it like when you, when you first started your journey? When you're living out down in Iraq and you decided to move north. What, what possessed you? How did you know? And so from the, from the uh, encounters of the past, the wells that start to spring forth, the new begins to spring forth. The Annas and the Simeons can see the Josephs and the Marys and say, you know, I see what you're carrying and it is powerful. But it's not the baby Jesus we're seeing. It's the returning king who's coming quickly. Not soon. Not like in soon and like, oh, in the next few weeks. But when he comes, whenever that moment is, which is sooner than it was last week, <laughs> he's going to come quickly. And when that, whoa, it's going to be violent. He's not coming for sin. He's not coming to help people out of sin when he comes. He's coming to judge 
and deal with stuff and to receive his bride and to break things free. And I think before he comes in that level, he's going to be seen in the church and there's going to be the great awakening. So we are evangelizing his body. We're calling forth the hearts of men to believe, the old and the young to believe again. So he says, they, uh, we, this, is, this is what maturity looks like. This looks like the skill, the being skilled in the word of righteousness. So there, if I can... No, there went the time. You give me five more minutes? Yes. At least get you, because I know these people get hung in the next, stuck in the next verses, and people have been asking me, I want to know what this all means. So I'll start, and we'll start up again next week in chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, which is the beginnings of this, the foundation of knowing this word of righteousness, let us go on to perfection. Perfection is completion. It is the goal of every believer to come into the resurrection life and into perfection. It's stated all throughout Scripture. So it's something so much beyond where we are currently. Most of us, I know I am, living. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation. So there's a foundation, six foundation truths, which when you read them, you can ask yourself, well, how comfortable would I be to explain these truths for myself? How much do I live in these truths? First truth is repentance from dead work. Dead works is more religious jargon than it is sin. It's the works that we do to try to make ourselves right, and we have to repent from that. We have to disengage. I cannot fix this. I will not be able to help this. I cannot make this right. But Jesus Christ has fixed this, made it right, and he is the one I must find and yield to and submit. That's repentance. I need to think another way of thinking than, than man-centric and humanistic, and it's up to me, and I'm, it's all about me. And go on to faith toward God. It's super, the faith. The, the God faith, the faith of God, the faith. I'm, 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 I want to realize that there, like we read in Isaiah, the seraphim look at the earth today. They're still singing over that glorified son of man, the Lord, Adonai. They're saying, the whole earth is full of the glory of God. So me, as a gazer, I ask the Lord, I want to see what you see. I want to see the earth filled with the glory of God. I want to see the faith that God carries. So that's the beginning. Now, move on out beyond the doctrines of baptisms. And we won't, I won't try to explain those. Doctrines of baptisms. There's so much of this immersion and brought into union into the family of God and doctrine. And, uh, and then the laying on of hands, what is imparted through the laying on of hands. And then the resurrection of the dead. And understanding that there's, it's, it's, it's a, an event and it's a man, a person. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Paul said, hey, I've got one goal in mind. And that is to, <laughs> to touch, to arrive at the resurrection from the dead. And trust me, he wasn't some old man thinking he wasn't saved. He was well saved. He was in something though. There's stuff we aren't touching and I want in on that. And eternal judgment, which is also a beautiful word. It's not, oh, how well did you do? Well, how kind of rewards do you get? That's part of it. But it's also coming into this recognition that when we were found in, when we, when Christ was revealed in us, it wasn't the first time God thought about us. Nor was it when God decided what to do with us. But he thought about us, decided what to do with us, called us, and he predestined us to conformity into the inheritance before time began. So we start living in this massive trust. Whatever, God, whatever, you know, gee, whatever, I'm in. And all I want to do is see you because when I see you, I find you. You are my future. You are my inheritance. You're my joy. So he says, okay, these are the, let's go on from here. And then verse 3, very trans, transform, very pivotal. This we will do if God permits. You don't get out of this until God releases you from it. And the beauty of God is, like I said, go to the milk. I love the milk. I, I'm, I'm forever defining meat in the milk. So it's not like a, uh, like, a, like a scientific approach. Well, we've got this body of information. Now let's go over here and study this body of information. 
It's all about experiencing Jesus and knowing him in these, these words and, and le- finding him and coming to him and being healed in him. So it's a continuum. Because why would it be, why would it be only God who permit us? And I, I don't think we barely ever, I get, I've got a pretty, I'm getting large thing about repentance from dead works. And I have some real new faith that's been given to me of God, in God, superimposed upon me from God. I am understanding the union, the one spirit, one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and I'm beginning to live more experientially from that. I don't yet fully in any way see the power and the... I, I see it intellectually, but I haven't fully experienced the means of the what can be done in the laying on of hands, the, the, the passing on of blessing, the healing, the uh, ordination, the setting people apart. I am repentance, uh, uh, resurrection from the dead. Oh, I, I, I linger looking and longing and beholding and in pursuit. And I, I purposely go into scripture to meditate every place that that is seen so I can see and eternal judgment, I am not yet even settled in who I am in Christ and where my place is. So how could I be fully into eternal judgment? So I know there's a, there's a permission. It's like God, you know, when you're getting ready to graduate, he says, okay, you're, you're still going to finish this up, but let's go, let's go take a tour of the new, the new campus. Let's go look at the new campus that we're coming to. Quick moment, and I'll get you in the new campus, and we'll close. So here's the new campus. Uh, it's impossible why God won't let you go beyond. For those who once were enlightened, there's five things. And they're all things that have brought us into Christ, but they're to be enlarged. Enlightening means to be illuminated. It's the same verse in Hebrews 10. It says, after you were illuminated, you endured such great uh, uh, hostility and 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 conflict it's to be born again it's for the for the light of the glory of god to be shining in our heart we see you can't teach people to see jesus you can point them in that direction but it's when you see it's the being born again the revelation i i met him he's appeared to me he's spoken to me and this place of enlightenment is is where from which i begin and where i continue and where i begin every day and the truth of who he is and have tasted the heavenly gift. You know the heavenly gift? You can ask the Samaritan woman. She, he, Jesus said to her in John 4, if you knew the gift of God that was speaking to you, you would ask of him and he would give you water and you would never thirst again. The heavenly gift is the communication and the acceptance and the eating of Jesus. As he said, eat my body, drink my blood. Just Oh, there's so much what he carries that we, I don't, I have no idea, but I'm getting closer. I feel him. He, and have become partakers, fellow partners, uh, a, a part of the Holy Spirit. Uh, spirit filled, of course, but, but you're, but, but it's in concert. It, it's pleased the Holy Spirit. It seemed, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The Holy Spirit said, separate unto me. He, he is administrating, is gifting, his fruit, partaking, living in the fellowship and friendship and, and abundance, and who have tasted the good, beautiful word, and here it is, the word rhema now, the things that God has spoken. And I believe for me, I've, taught, I've heard so little, but I, there's so much more. I know I, I, he's letting me see things that I know where am I here, so therefore, praise God, I'm not fearful of the impossible because I'm just coming in. Because watch this one. And the powers, tasted the powers of the ages to come. I've seen miracles. I've prayed for people and they've been made well. I've seen a lot of things, but I've not seen the powers of the age to come. We're talking about millennial truths that are stepping into the earth that will start to appear. We're, stop, we're talking about things that, that are reserved for the matured because the matured will, part, will, will make room for the, for the emergence of the Lord Jesus to be seen because we won't shut him down like what Wes pointed out. You can get so holy or go through so much trauma that all you want to do is lay in your bed and keep your feet clean. 
And then God comes and says, come on, now that isn't what I saved you for. Come on out of here. And then you go, and then you get beat up. And then you go, wow. And you know what? Wes, you left the best part out. Because it's the church choir, the, the daughters of Jerusalem. Say, hey, what, 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 what in the world's about your beloved? Give me a break. What's he in, what makes him any more unique? You know, what's this, all this stuff about Jesus? Well, we already know Jesus. Dear God, we don't know Jesus. She says, I'll tell you who my beloved is. And she starts right, right, just describing him. That's maturity. Can you describe your beloved? And by the time she's finished describing her beloved, the daughters of Jerusalem says, you tell us where he is. I want to go find him. The power of praising someone you cannot see brings the one you cannot see to see even in others. And the first thing she says, I'll tell you where he is now. <laughs> they just got my head out of my head, out of, you know, out of my life and put my voice back into the hymns. I see him. I see him. Powers the age. Because if they fall away, and I'll stop here, because this is where people, they just freak out. We're so, so carnal, so baby, so immature in our thinking, like God is treating us like we actually can do anything because he told us to do something. Dear God, we are only dependent upon the life of Jesus, dependent upon the grace, dependent upon surrendering and yielding and allowing him to take preeminence and knowing he's everything. And that is just a lifetime of discovery by failure in our own selves and acceptance of himself. And this process is, is, is when, it, when God permits, he takes you in a place, you start operating in a place that is is off building from the word of righteousness into the truth of, of, of Christ in his likeness. And he says it, it, it's impossible if they fall away. It means that you, you, you're, you're in this and you're going, I don't know. Yeah. You're not, you just walk away. You just step out. You separate yourself from one who's been coming under the word, being brought through, discipled through persecution, coming back into truth, going through the situation. And you just say, I don't know. I have, da, 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 da. Then to renew them to repentance again. Because what it requires is that you return back to the milk of the, re, of the cross and, the, and re-crucify Jesus, which is, just becomes like a kind of a, uh, 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 unacceptable thing. And it's not any of us in this room. Let's, let me say, it's not me. I'm not in danger of that. I've backslid many times. I backslide usually a few times a day. Because the backslider in heart is full of his own self. You get full of yourself, you're backsliding. So I know that. I know that's... But, but why would we not want to reach to this farthest place, to this just... Just knowing this high priest. And without a high priest, you can't, this relationship will not work. There is no, Jesus saved me, that's how come I walk. No, this is my high priest, in which the chapters ahead will begin to open up all of what he brings that we do not carry, that we receive. And so he closes it, and we'll go back and meditate in 6 and 7 this week. Verse 7, it says, um, the earth is an example. If the earth gets all this water, and it gets all this support. And then it brings up the seed and the plants that was sown in it by the one who sowed it. It gets a blessing. And it enters into another place of, of, of receiving. It, but if it bears thorns, if the same water that came and the same seed that was sown, but nothing comes out of it but thorns and bri and briars, it's rejected and near to be cursed, whose end is to be burned. So the Lord does not permit us to advance past where he, we are living experientially inside of truth in the center of Christ. When he begins to take us on little tours, we see and then we have to get buffeted to, to embrace what we see even in the buffeting. And then the fruit will start coming. It's the seed sown in the heart and 30, 40, 60, 100 fold after you, after you endure and hold it with a good heart. Verse 9 and I close. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. I am confident of better things concerning of all of the living body in Jubilee. 
I am, I've never seen a people humbling themselves as, as readily, submitting themselves completely, trusting God for everything, no longer wanting anything, not trying to force their way to the front of the line. <laughs> None of that. It's growing. It's, it's falling off because there's better things that accompany salvation. I want to touch what accompanies. I want to touch those things. Though we speak in this manner for God, and here is so simple, God's not unjust to forget our work and our labor of love, which we've shown toward his name. How do we do that? Because we minister to the saints and do minister. We just love the center of perfection, the completion. Lord Jesus, we opened up a big door. You're so big to do it. You're the high priest to bring us into discovery. These are things about you. And they'll be exposed and expanded. There's such deep, deep, deep truth. I've you, we've lived so shallow when we could live so deep. We've, come, we've lived on the earth when we could live in heaven. We've identified with the, the soul of our life and the, and the intent of what we wanted instead of you and what you've given. But we're changing. Oh, beloved, Father, I pray that this week, even in the meditation inside Hebrew, there will be an illumination coming in all of us, enlightenment. Whoa, they saw that. Did you see that? Whoa. There'll come repentance from the dead works. They're coming, a, a returning into a faith, a fresh faith. Lord Jesus, do what you can only do. We need you, Jesus. We are, we are, without no, seeing you and knowing you, we will just be babies. And without seeing you and knowing you in your living word, we will just be babies. And we will just live in these repeating cycles of, I need milk, I need milk, I need milk, I need someone else to teach me. And we declare that you are more than able at your appointed time to call forth the matured sons of God, to liberate the planet Earth, to begin to unlock the glory of God that's filling the Earth even at this moment. And the knowledge of the glory of God begins to be heard and seen. So God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, help us, help me. Help me, me first, me first. My eyes are dull, my ears are dull, my heart is hard. I want to see with my eyes, hear with my heart, uh, hear, understand with my heart, hear with my ears, and turn. Would you this week, for everyone here, everyone listening, everyone online, we're asking for these encounters with the high priest in the living word and transformations and, in, and, and liberations and freedom. Even these beautiful six foundational truths and these five beyond any of our, beyond, way beyond me, way beyond me. But I don't want to wait because it's beyond me. I want to in pursuit. Grace, grace through our living Jesus, our high priest, We'll unlock our lives this week in truth and in spirit, in sanctification, into the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.